What's up, everybody? You are here for episode nine of Motivation with me. So I apologize. I know I've been out for a little while, haven't posted a YouTube video, and it's really because I've been doing so much. Um, because on top of being an activist and a blogger and a blogger and running a nonprofit, I also have a part time HR job. I do bookkeeping and accounting for local small businesses in Houston, and I write books, obviously. And I also help others write their books. So if you have not checked out my website, visit MirandaEvans.com, and you will see all the services that I provide, whether it's writing and publishing, um, website design, bookkeeping for your business, budgeting. I have so many different talents and so many things that I do to help others. And in order to run a nonprofit, you have to have a for profit. So, and then you want to always have multiple streams of income. So that's why I've been late on my videos, but I'm trying to get back in the groove. And then I'm also dealing with some personal issues, which is related to child sex abuse, hence the series. So, you know, had to take a small break, but I'm back and I'm better. Um, so today we're going to talk about the effects, trauma, and aftermath of child sex abuse. Because I am doing my videos based on my blogs on my website, again, MirandaEvans.com. And so every time I write a blog, I try to follow up or I will be following up with a YouTube video. So <clears throat> statistics or, yeah, eh, information. So, um, and I'm reading this off of from my blog because I want to make sure I get this right. So psychology today lists the following symptoms of sexual abuse okay whether it's in children or adults um it is withdrawal and mistrust of adults suicide difficult relating to others except in sexual or seductive ways unusual interest in or avoidance of all things sexual or physical sleep problems nightmares fears of going to bed frequent accidents or self-injurious behavior Refusal to go to school or the doctor or home. Secret, secretiveness or unusual aggressiveness. Sexual components to drawings and games. Neurotic reactions, obsessions, compulsiveness, phobias, things like that. Habit disorders like biting or rocking. Unusual sexual knowledge or behavior. Prostitution, forcing sexual acts on other children extreme fear of being touched and unwillingness to submit to physical examination. So those are some of the symptoms of sexual abuse. So be aware of these, look out for them, especially in children. So as parents, as people, you know, caretakers, family members, teachers, counselors, religious leaders, just be aware of these symptoms, okay? Because like me, most of these symptoms can be easily written off as the bad teenager or she's just in her teenage stage and she's just angry and acting out and, you know, she's going through her puberty stage, so to speak, or, or he, because this is also for men and women. So that's what happened to me. You know, I was labeled as troubled, angry disrespectful and yes i did get angry after my father was killed at 11 then my grandfather then my godfather so i did act out but i didn't start really acting out until after my molestation which started you know right before I, right before i turned 13. didn't lose my virginity until 14. main reason why i lost my virginity is for one i was molested so as you can see from the symptoms it's, I always say people go one or two ways. Usually sexual abuse victims go one or two ways. They either become overly sexually active or they shut down completely sexually. They don't want to be touched, any of that. Like, don't even get within the vicinity. And I've experienced both. I've experienced more of not wanting to be touched as an adult, but as a child and a teenager, I acted out sexually. Because my thinking was, well... And especially when, you know, no one believes you. So you start to think as a child, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe someone is supposed to be touching me or maybe I'm supposed to be having sex. So that was my thing. I thought it was what I was supposed to be doing. And, you know, I lost my virginity at 14 for that reason. And also because I was afraid my stepdad was going to rape me. Because if you can molest somebody, then you can also like, what's to stop you from progressing to rape? 
fondling, molestation, what's, what's to stop you from progressing? So I had a boyfriend at the time, my first actual real boyfriend, and I would have much rather lost my virginity to him than to my stepdad. And that was my thinking, like, let's just get it over with. Like, let's just go ahead and get it over with because I don't want to be raped. Like, I don't want, you know, I, I can't imagine my stepdad being the person that took my virginity. And unfortunately, that's the fear that I had. Because, you know, it started and it lasted for so long. So, like I said, what's to stop a person from progressing? Um, so don't, don't write off this behavior as it's just a teenager acting out. Okay. You need to actually talk to them or reach somebody else that can talk to them. If it becomes really aggressive to the point where this person is breaking things, or they're sleeping all the time and they don't want to go to school, they don't want to do anything, signs of depression or signs of trauma or, again, signs of sexual abuse, then they need to seek a counselor. Because the counselor who is trained in this or the therapist or the psychiatrist or psychologist will know what those signs are and be able to, I know, especially if you go to a psychiatrist, because there's actually, you know, text and and um i'm sorry i just got a message and it just completely threw me off um but excuse me but it basically they i know when i went i had to take a series of tests to get my diagnosis so these people are medic are medically trained to be able to recognize these signs and tell you what they could be you know or if it's a possible sexual abuse situation you know, especially for children, because it's hard for children to kind of explain what happened to them because they haven't really fully processed it. I know with my family, one of the main excuses that I got on why they didn't do anything was, OK, well, I didn't have enough detail or I didn't have enough information or I went with, you know, what I knew at the time. OK, I'm 13. How much detail do you need other than? this man molested me and touched me every night for a year. I mean, do you want me to go into detail about how he did it, what all he did? Like, I can do that, but I was trying to save and spare my mom and my family from having to hear these gruesome and horrific details. Because just the fact that I told you I was molested should have been alone. I mean, alone should have been enough. Like, I didn't, I, you, you're not an investigator. You're not going to sit here and say, okay, well, what happened? When it happened? What? No, that's not what's going to happen. But now I've come to the conclusion that, okay, if you want to hear details and you're still all like, well, I didn't have the details. Well, okay, let me give you the details, okay? Because I'm going to give you the same horrific details and image that I have in my head every day on what happened. So if that's what you want, then fine. But as a child, I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't even know what was going on. And it was like, okay, well, what do you want to do? Because in my, in my blog, I've made the quote, you know, um, cause we're asked like, what do you want to do? And what's next or what? It, like, that's not my decision to make. You're the adult. I'm the child. So you should be able to make that decision, especially as a parent or as a family member. So I made the quote, children aren't given choices, nor should they be forced to make them. Because as children, we aren't given choices. Like, we're children. So it's kind of like, you do what I say, period. I'm the, I'm the parent, you're the child, you do what I say. So we aren't given choices, nor should a child be forced to make a choice. So you can't ask a child, what do you want to do? Because what you want to do doesn't matter. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the police. We're going to file a report. We're going to make sure that this does not happen again. That That is how that is supposed to be handled, okay? It's not up to the child. You don't ask the child to make the decision. Because when somebody, and then this is like, you got to remember, this is back in the day. So we didn't have social media. We didn't have all these news, um, Twitters and really like know what's going on as far as law enforcement so when somebody tells me you know specifically my mom says do you want to file a police report i'm like what's a police report police report what wait what what are we talking about like i'm 13 what 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 i don't understand like what you tell me what to do you're the adult what do you, what do we do i'm looking at you like what do we do and you asking me what what you want to do 
No, that's not how you handle that situation. As a parent, as an adult, as a family member, as a mentor, as a counselor, you are in charge of taking over the situation and making sure that that child is safe, okay? You are also in charge as a parent, parents, mother, father, to explain to your child or children that people aren't supposed to touch you in certain places, okay? You educate your child on their body, what's somebody what somebody's supposed to be doing, what somebody's not supposed to be doing. You there's literally manuals <laughs> and instructions for this if you don't know how to do it. You know, you, you're supposed to give them the sex talk. Talk about safe sex. Like these are all things that you need to do because if you let life and society teach them, then they're gonna learn the wrong thing. So I didn't get the sex conversation. I got the, oh, you got busted, so now you got to explain to me what sex is. Because I, in my mind as a kid, I'm thinking you're in trouble. Somebody's harming you. Like, oh, my God, what's going on? So please sit your child down and explain to them. And if you need resources, the mama, the mama bear effect.org literally sells bookmarks flyers like they have free downloadable information on how to educate children on what's right and what's wrong okay keep protect your body don't let anybody touch you stranger danger like literally it's there the literature is there you don't even have to come up with it it's given to you by instruction okay so this is something that we need to do don't write off those symptoms okay most of my symptoms were angry violent uh, promiscuity, um, thinking about suicide or attempting suicide, because I did, um, withdrawal from adults, like I didn't trust anybody, especially coming from a family that didn't believe me, it was kind of like, uh, I don't really trust you, but I got to deal with you because I'm a kid and I don't have anybody else. So unusual sexual behavior, extreme fear of being touched, like Unusual aggression, like there's a difference between a teenager with hormones that's getting disrespectful or talking back than a teenager that's fighting consistently at school or fighting always violent, throwing stuff, punching holes in the wall. Like I was that type of person because my thinking was you didn't care about me, so I don't care about you. Like where where were you at? You know, why didn't you you didn't protect me? So I have I didn't have any respect for anybody. Um and when it's when you see symptoms like that and it's severe and you can see the pain in a child's face, then it's time to start investigating, start asking questions. OK, and if you can't do it, send the child to somebody who can. Don't let that child suffer and write it off as, oh, they're just acting out. No. OK, that's not we have mentoring programs now. Now, back in my day, I wish I had a mentor like me because I could have reached out okay I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had to suffer alone because that's how I felt it was I wrote a poem called a silent scream and that's how I felt I was screaming on the inside but I shut down and I didn't have anybody to go to to talk to to I had you know the most I got was my dance teacher and a counselor that I had in high school Dr. Mosby is phenomenal Okay, she helped me a lot. And this was around the time I was trying to, I was suicidal. So there are options now. Like we have availability that children can go to. We talk about mental health. Mental health is really big now. They have websites. They have school counselors. They, like, you got the trouble movement. Like there's so many options out there. You just have to be willing to find those options and actually seek help whether you're an adult or a child, but it's specifically for a child, okay? So those are the symptoms, the effects, the kind of like the aftermath. Now, as an adult, because we have to remember, when a child is sexually abused, that follows them into adulthood, okay? It never, it never goes away. Even though you heal from it, there's still a small part of you that's, that's been abused. Like you've been touched and you've been in your sacred space. So even as an adult, I shield myself. I go to sleep literally subconsciously like this. I sleep like this without even realizing that I'm sleeping like this. I'm covering my boobs because what? My stepdad used to touch them at night. So I sleep like this or I'll sleep on my side with my arm under like I'm trying to cover myself as an adult living in a house by myself 
I'm still like subconsciously trying to protect myself. When I hug people or men of a certain age, I hug from the side. You know, I'm not as, a, as affectionate. Like, give me a side hug because I don't want my body up against your body. That's how serious it is. And you don't even realize it's that, that you're doing it. It's just, it's, a, it's an effect. And it's called PTSD. It's called post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's crazy and it's ironic because I just had a situation at the gas station earlier. You know, and I've been robbed at gunpoint, which doesn't make it any better. You know, when you've had a gun in your face, then that's that's just take the PTSD to a whole nother level. And I had a situation at the gas station where a guy was trying to talk to me and yelling at me from inside his car. And I politely asked him, you know, leave me alone. I'm good. And no, I'm. you don't need to know my name. You don't need my number. None of that. Dude proceeds to get out of the car. And. I'm at the gas pump half in, half out the car. My door is open. He proceeds to get out the car and come over behind my door trying to shake my hand and talk to me. Sir, back up, okay? You don't Back up because you're scaring me right now. I don't know what's in your hand. I don't know what's in your pocket. I don't know what you're about to pull. You're too close to me. you all in my car space. you all in my personal space because when you're abused or when you have experienced something traumatic, everybody is suspect. Okay, it's not something that we can control. I don't like living in fear. I don't like living paranoid. I don't like looking at people like, oh my God, are they going to hurt me? That's, that's, it, it's terrible. It's a fear that you can't do anything about because somebody else did something to you to ruin your life and your mentality. So, you know, I'm naturally like, hey, you know, back up. Meanwhile, my heart is beating out of my chest. And when you come at someone who's been abused, and I'm not expecting that person to know, but you don't, do not approach a woman as a man aggressively like that because you never know how that person is going to react. You cannot just walk up to people, knock on their doors, follow them, yell at them, cat call. You cannot do that. Okay. So when you do that, you are now entering into my personal space. So now you're scaring me. And when I get scared, there's a fight that's about to happen after that because I, it's a fight or flight situation. I'm going to defend myself. I try to hold back and like, okay, let me see. But if you, if you make one wrong move, you're going to get this two piece. That's just what it is. And if I tell you I don't want to talk to you in a nice manner and you still continue to harass me, that's when I'm going to get upset. So I just had that situation. And literally, I'm like, my heart is beating out my chest. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What is he going to do? What is he going to do? I can't see his hands. Like, what? He might pull some out of his pocket. Like, dude, you back up. Back up. Please back up. You know? And that's that's how abuse victims act. That's how people who've been in traumatic situations act. Because they think that you're going to harm them. Because they've been harmed. So they're on high alert. They're paying attention to their surroundings. And it could not happen. Like, I'm pretty sure dude was just trying to be nice, but it's like, bro, okay, if I told you why you were in the car, leave me alone, that does not mean get out of your car and come towards me. Like, that would put anybody in a, in a, what, what is going on situation, you know? So, that was a scare for me. I don't like going places at night. It took me a while to go to CVS because when I was arrived at gunpoint, I was working at CVS. I couldn't even go to CVS. I don't like going to the store at night. I don't like carrying big purses. I just, I, I can't do it. So that hinders me. I still have social anxiety. I can't be around a lot of people, which is why I don't go out very much. I don't like, like, literally parking, anything, being out at night, like, and, and walking at night. It's, it's all just trauma and aftermath and side effects. And it's hard to have a life dealing with that because of something that was not your fault okay so do i forgive my forgive my stepdad as my abuser do i even forgive my rapist do i forgive my mom and my family yes okay for one i'm a child of god so i forgive them but that does not take away from the fact that you ruined my life you did that to me okay i didn't ask to be abused you did that so you have to take responsibility for what you did and that's the part that we don't see. This is something that we're, I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. I have to be surrounded by people who understand it. That's another thing. Keep people around you who understand what you're going through.
okay, and who understand how severe mental health is. And I always say you people can't completely understand a situation they've never been put in. So if you have not been sexually abused or abused in any way, you can't imagine how an abuse victim feels. But you can always be comforting in some sort of way. I only keep positive people in my circle, okay? Family is, you cut off. I can't do it. It's toxic. It's toxic. Because to this day, I still have to deal with a family who didn't believe me, okay? I'm 27 years old. We were talking about 14, 15 years ago. And you're still playing the same tune. When are you going to understand? You're not, okay, that's fine. I'm going to remove myself because I protect my energy. So I'm surrounded by friends that really support me and that are positive with me and that are going through this journey with me, especially my older cousin, Ashley. I don't know what I would do without her. She was my outcry witness. She was the person that I told first. And even when I told her as a child, it was kind of like one of those, okay, I got to tell you something, but don't say nothing because I don't want to get in trouble and I'm scared and I just, I don't want to get in trouble. Like they, they might not, they might be mad. They might not believe me. Like, you know, it's my word against his. Like, I don't even know what is, what's going on. Like, what is this normal? And so she's like, well, what is it? What is it? What is it? And my cousin was way, way more mature than me. And she's always been protective of me. So when I explained to her, <laughs> sleeping, like on my boobs and on my vagina and it's like every night and it's been happening for almost a year. She flipped shit. Like, what? Why you didn't say nothing? Why you didn't tell me? Why you didn't tell nobody? You gotta tell somebody. And I'm just like, no, shh. You know, promise me you won't say anything. Like, no, I don't want to get in trouble. My whole mindset is, oh my God, I'm gonna get in trouble. So I didn't like confrontation as a kid, which is why I didn't say anything earlier. Because it's like I don't I don't want I don't wanna Am I going to, like, I could have screamed. I could have easily screamed. My mama would have came in. Everything would have been over. But I'm like, no, I don't want to scream because there's going to be a fight. And then, like, you thinking as a child, you don't know what's right or wrong. You don't know what to do in that situation. So I didn't really know how to say anything. So I told my cousin, she pinky promised me she wasn't going to say nothing. And then called my aunt like five minutes later. So, but I'm, and I was mad at her at the time because it was like, I told you not to say nothing. But I thank God to this day that she was mature enough to make that decision because I couldn't stand up for myself. So my cousin stood up for me until I was old enough to really stand up for myself. And the main reason why victims, especially children, don't say anything is because they're scared they're not going to be believed. OK, they're scared. Nobody's going to believe them, even as adults. I mean, we're in the we're in Me Too movement era. So everybody's like, well, what took them so long? They don't they think somebody's not going to believe them. And when you don't believe a victim, that re-victimizes them. That's worse than the abuse is when you don't have somebody that believes you. And what happened? I was scared. Somebody wasn't going to believe me. My mom wasn't going to believe me. My family wasn't going to believe me. And guess what? They didn't believe me. So they made the fear that I had a reality. So that's the number one reason why it's hard for abuse victims to seek help or to tell someone. But we're got, and that's what my next video is about, like how to release your silence and how to tell someone. There's a there's a process too, especially now that we have more resources. But all of these symptoms are in children, and when that child gets older. It's, it's still there, okay? I still have anger management issues. If you follow me on social media, you know I'm a, I'm a, I will rant, okay? I still have to deal with anger. I've gotten a lot better at it, but I had to, I go to therapy. I seek help. I make sure that I stay positive. I stay in the word of God, for one, because without God, without my faith, I would not be here. Like, I literally would not be able to make it day by day without God. So I try to keep a positive mindset and I do positive things in the community. That's why I'm an activist. That's why I fight so hard for abuse. That's why I fight so hard about certain things because it's like we need to make a change. OK, and I'm old enough to where I can fight. I didn't have that strength back then. And all I can see is that little 13 year old girl I used to be who couldn't stand up for herself, who was stuck living in a house with the same person that molested her. Because she didn't want to go to CPS. She didn't want to be in the system. She didn't want to be taken away from her mommy. So it's this helpless little girl 
And I could literally see myself as this helpless little girl. But now that I'm a grown woman and I've healed, I've forgiven, I've gotten stronger. Now I have the courage to stand up not only for myself, but for everybody else that's out there suffering. Okay? Because when you speak your story, then it shows somebody else they're not alone. And then they speak their story. And then somebody else speaks their story. And then somebody else speaks their story. So it's a domino effect. It's a movement. Hence the trouble movement. I started a movement, and I'm happy about that because the more we speak out and the more we talk about it, the more someone else is going to talk about their situation, okay? So, and I did a statistic, just so I can show you. I did a statistic. It was a room full of, like, 15 girls, okay? Anonymous, completely anonymous, 15 girls. I asked three questions. I said, of the 15 in here, they wrote it down on the index card, didn't put a name on it, anything. Have you ever been abused in any way, physical, sexual? Any, have you ever been abused? Of the 15, 10 said yes. Okay. Second question. Did you tell somebody? Of the 10, 7. Okay. Third question. Did you go to the police? Did you file a police report? Three. Two and a half, really. That's sad, okay? That's a sad, that's sad. Because in a room full of 15 young teenage girls, 10 of them were abused. And three of them have not went to the cops. And I'm sorry, three only three of them went to the cops. Only seven of them told somebody. So that means that there are still three girls who have not said anything, who are still holding on to this abuse that goes to show you how common it is one in three people and one in, one in three women one in four men one in sorry one in seven men the sexual abuse and domestic violence have different statistics but they're kind of similar they're kind of close that's crazy so can you imagine being in a room full of people and literally over half the room or at least half the room has been abused in some way like you you never know. It could be somebody in your family, and they haven't said anything. So pay attention to those signs. Pay attention to those symptoms, okay? Because my family wrote it off as me being troubled. I was not troubled until after I was molested. I was not a disrespectful teenager. I was in pain. I was a victim. And you didn't recognize my symptoms, okay? And so imagine how many kids out there are going through this and have these symptoms and nobody notices. Nobody knows. So that is why I'm here to educate you and pray that as, as a society or as a people, we do better with protecting our children, paying attention to our children, talking to our children, being there for them, telling them what's right and wrong, Seek getting help for them if they need it, putting them in organizations like the Trouble Movement or any other Boys and Girls Club or whatever, some type of mentoring organization, somebody that they can talk to that they can trust, whether it's a school counselor, those as well. So pay attention to the signs. Like I said, my next video will be episode 10 which I'm not going to give y'all a date on when that's coming out. I'm, I'm going to try my hardest for it to be within a week. But episode 10, after I write the blog, because it's blogged and vlogged, um, will be about how to tell someone and how to release the silence. Not, It doesn't have to be publicly like me. That's not, you don't have to start that way. Just how to just tell someone, just one person, just get it out. Don't hold it in. Don't suffer by yourself. Don't suffer silently. How to tell someone and who to tell, how to determine who am I going to tell that I trust. So that's what the next blog and vlog will be about. So thanks again for joining in. I'm trying to keep my videos a little bit shorter, but that is um, Effects, Trauma, and the Aftermath. If you have not read the blog that relates to this video, please visit MirandaEvans.com. And my blog screen is the first screen that pops up, so it's my home screen. And click on it, read through it. It's relatively short. 
but it's much needed. It's information that you need. And it's a mix of my story and general advice, general motivation, because y'all know how I do. I motivate, hence motivation with me. But at the same time, I have to give my story as well so that you know I'm speaking from experience here. Okay. And if I can be open about my story, then like I said, it's a domino effect. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. We're going to talk about how to tell someone. So thank you again for tuning in to episode nine of Motivation with Me.